The name 19 Keys came about because I used to sell a lot of cocaine. <laughs> no, I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> From an early age, the goal was always protecting the culture. If you see a problem, solve it. What you complain? Why are you waiting on somebody else to do it? When I hear people complaining about different leaders, well, maybe if it was more, it would be easier. Maybe if they had an army behind them. Maybe if they could call upon you when they needed to. Public school was different. That's where Savage Keys come from. You know what I'm saying? That's, that wasn't the same level of discipline, right? You know what I do, but you think I do too much. Because in comparison, you're not doing the same. If you have a gift, especially one that people are willing to pay for, you have to use that in some capacity to change the world. I see no reason why I couldn't enjoy living in Africa for the rest of my life. The idea that America is just this great place is the biggest deception on the planet Earth. The reason is because everybody's working, but nobody's living. My name is 19 Keys. What I do in detail, I'm a thought leader. Thought leader is somebody who leads people to a greater way of thinking, which ultimately leads people to a greater way of doing. And my thought leadership is a representation of my skill sets and my expertise in different fields and different industries. From an intellectual standpoint, from a mental, spiritual, and physical. So I have my particular teachings and then I have the teachings of others that I spread as well in a form of curation on what I believe are the necessary things that we should be spending our time budget on, right? Because what we pay attention to is directly correlated to the reality that we live. And so as an author, the books that I put out and the books that I will put out are all about mental, spiritual, physical, financial development in a sense to where you don't have to come to me for leadership is literally teaching you how to lead yourself the questions that people have in their mind when it comes to how to break the spells right how to change their reality right because when you learn how to master your reality then you can master effects on everybody else's reality as well when you're a child you have a great imagination and this imagination is in, I want to change the world. And then when you're an adult, it shrinks it more and more and more to be realistic, be realistic, be realistic, be realistic until people are blind, right? Until there's no vision at all. And then they're wondering, what should I do? What brings me happiness? What brings me purpose? What brings me meaning? That means somebody has put a blindfold on you and not just your physical eyes, but your mental eyes. Because now you're not even seeing with your third, which is a, the ability to release yourself from any prison because you can see in your mind's eye anything that you desire and then you give yourself purpose by bringing that out into reality. And so as a man who comes from the diaspora, many of our stories are in connection to oppression and colonization and slavery, but that's not what I feed my mind's eye. My mind's eye is the stories of heroes' tales. My mind's eye is the story of royalty and nobility, right? And so that I feed myself and I invigorate myself with that sort of godhood. And for the rest of the world, I teach them to challenge what's in their mind's eye, right? Challenge the story that you've been told. Challenge the narratives that you're being sold every single day. Challenge the existing systems, traditionalisms, indoctrinations, ways that you've shaped who you are, the things that you allow society to make you fear, right? Which are the things that control you the most. No man and woman can have full faith in God if they fear man and they fear system. Or if I speak up, then they're gonna take this away. Well, which one do you fear more? Because the only way to truly serve God is to speak up for him, right? If, if a dog would yell or bark because his master is being attacked, right? When falsehood is being spread on the planet Earth, that's God being attacked, right? Even a dog has the ability to protect his master. How, how does man not speak truth to speak up for his master, which will be God, right? And so 
and that is demonstration. We speak in communication to show you like, yo, you can go out there and we can speak at the highest level, right? And I didn't get a traditional education. So the way that I speak is through observation and self-study and, you know, honing in those skill sets. And part of that is demonstration. Like, yo, we can actually communicate our thoughts at a high level, right? And then in that demonstration, you know, we're going to get fly fashionable, right? Because when I look at all the leaders that I look up to, they were in uniform, right? They were clean. They were presentable because what you say is just as important to how you present yourself, right? How you present yourself is important as what you say when these things are aligned and correlated, right? In connection to the sublimeness and oddness to where a person can see a representation of not what you're just saying that's coming out your head, but the way you carry it and the way you represent it in your leadership and how you dress, right? So my style is military luxury, right? I'm gonna step outside in full, you know, regalia, decadence and discipline. You understand me? Bringing the, 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 the best of both worlds. And then at the same time, we're gonna get fly because we want to change the archetype of what's being looked up to by the youth to say, wait a minute, you can look up to an intellectual the same way you look up to somebody who spreads nothing but escapism and distraction and entertainment, right? And if the entertainers were good role models, then we would have to change the archetype. But at the same time, when our culture is being connected to our entertainment and it's not being connected to our scholarship, right? It's not being connected to, you know, um, our leadership and our social justice movements and our historians right and our futurists and our technologists what we have to represent our society is the very people that get famous off uh, distracting us because that's what entertainment is it is a distraction from the world of responsibility and discipline which sometimes is needed in a world of balance there's work and then there's life but when you do work that's passionate your work is your life Right. And so the need for distraction dwindles and it becomes very small because what you do, you enjoy. So you don't have to leave what you do to find joy. So when we are, you know, creating these new disciplines to where if a person asks me what I do and I say, well, I do what you see me doing. What do you see me doing? Let's just dissect it because we think a title is what a person does. That's the illusion. If you and this is how I want people to get real eyes to see real life. If you see a man and you have to ask what he do, watch him. Watch him. If you watch me, you say, okay, Keys has a number one show called High Level Conversations. Well, what does that mean? That means he must be a media. That must he means, well, he said he put up his own money. That must mean he's an executive producer. Those are two titles right there, right? Just right there, those two titles. But people don't want to give you too many. I said that I design my own crowns. So does that mean I'm a designer? I said, I style myself. Does that mean I'm a stylist? <laughs> right? You know, I, I speak around the world. That means I am a global speaker. Right? I have a helpful company. So that means I'm an entrepreneur. I have a family business. Right? So that also means I'm a manager of that business. Right? And, and everything that comes along with that, that I have to do. A brand or a marketer, a salesman. Right? I create content. So I'm also a content creator. Right? I'm influential. Right. All of these things, but people are afraid to give you all of those titles. So they ask you for what? Right. So it's not that you don't know. You know what I do, but you think I do too much because in comparison, you're not doing the same. You know, it started from my parents. You know, my father was a bit of a revolutionary street guy at the same time. You know, coming from Illinois, my mother from Missouri, St. Louis, Missouri, and they met. You know, actually it met when my father was locked up in prison. He ended up sending her letters. And he, I believe, knew that that was the one for him. And at first she didn't get the letters because my grandma would hide them. And then one day, you know, she found them. And then the love story began. And then after they met each other, they uh, went to go see the Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan. And then they converted into Islam shortly after that. So for me, my story starts right there in their conversion, right? Because without the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in my life, without them telling me from an earliest memory as a child, before I had recollection of understanding of what these big concepts meant, I was told that, hey, you are a God. I was made to repeat that, right? So we grew up, I was born in St. Louis Barnes Jewish Hospital. And then we moved when I was like, 
maybe two years old, to Oakland, California. And so my father was a part of a very militant black Muslim organization. My mother was a school teacher at the time. And the concepts and ideas that we were taught in school weren't your normal curriculum, right? So we were, taught to, we were told about the world, the social injustices, the system, but we was also told who we were and given the task and the ability to challenge the world, right? And be our true selves. Right, I was told the original man is the Asiatic black man, the maker, the owner, the cream of the planet Earth, the God of the universe. We had to learn general orders, which was military instructions. I drilled since I was a child up until adult, right? So like 20 plus years, we would go outside. We had school all year round, right? So in the hot summer sun, we are outside drilling. And this was to produce discipline in the young mind, right? So we out in what we call the field, when we out in the streets, we would go neighborhood to neighborhood and we would line up all black suits, right? Red bow ties, ball head, and we would drill. Left feet, right feet, bow feet, wrist is loop, ready for How you feel? Fine, sir. And we're yelling and the crowds, we in the regular hood and they see this and they amazed because they've never seen black men with this much discipline and we're listening to each other and there's no ego, right? And at the time when we were doing it, it didn't feel like it was something incredible. It felt normal as a lifestyle, right? Because that's all that I knew. But at the same time, we grew up in the streets, so I knew that everybody weren't doing that, right? The kids that we would go back after school and we would go into the neighborhood and those kids were savages. Those kids were rambunctious, right? So we used to get into a lot of fights growing up because we were like the only Muslim family on the block. So anytime somebody tried to make fun of that, I always felt the necessity to defend that. And so, you know, growing up in an environment where there was extreme discipline, where if we got out of line, you know, our school would separate the boys and the girls. They would hit us with rulers and paddles. There was one called Old Thunder one time. It had these holes in it, like 10 holes in it. And it was a big ass paddle. They would swing it all the way from South base and they hit you with a home run. And it hurt. You know what I'm saying? And there's a teacher to this day that I can name that I hate because of that still. <laughs> I want my get back. <laughs> no, but, um, you know, that school was a school that did not teach based on the education system that we have today it was based on your aptitude and learning. So if I had a fifth grade reading, then I was bumped up to fifth grade reading, right? So you weren't held behind because of your age and it determined it. It was more customized that if you can excel, then let's put it you where you excel in different areas. Class sizes were smaller. So everything that I learned from Elijah's Educational Center, I remember. We were taught what they call the uh, student enrollment, which were lessons given by Elijah Muhammad, right? Um, we were taught actual facts, which were statistics of the planet Earth and the universe, right? So we were always taught that the Earth is 196,940,000 square miles, right? And the reason that we were taught the Earth, the lands, the rivers, right um the specific of the indian ocean atlantic ocean right we were taught how much uh, useful land is on the planet earth how far the distance is of the sun and the earth the 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 speed of sound and light and all that is because we were taught that this is our universe we were taught that this is our earth so you have to know your real estate so we were taught these things so that we could take ownership of them and for me that really deepened and instilled in me as a child Right, so when most people have limits in their ideas and thinking, right, I don't have that. So when people grade me by what they believe is correct, because they went to a college and they got a degree and they think that those things are right. Well, I was always taught to think beyond traditional systems. So me knowing from an early age growing up, you know, in Oakland, California, seeing black men with power, seeing them have you know, ownership, seeing them have political power, seeing them run for political position, seeing my father have uh, men under, you know, um, his control and in ranks. And it, it was it was a different paradigm that I grew up in, right? Completely different. And then anybody that's from Oakland, you have a certain level of historic consciousness, right? A certain level of revolutionary spirit because it's also the home of the Black Panthers, right? You know, a lot of things that happen in Oakland, you know, trickle to the rest of the world, right? We are a very outspoken people and we gang tight, 
But at the same time, Oakland is a city of pimping, a city of players. You know, it don't have gang banging, right? But it still has a lot of street gangs and activities that go on. And Oakland is a very dangerous city, right? So you're surrounded by killers a lot. So I grew up in a paradigm where we had a job. I remember once when I was like 16 years old and the job was to work at this high school as a security guard. Now, I was too young really to be working there because I'm almost as close in age as the middle schoolers that went there. But the job was to make sure that the pimps in the neighborhood were not recruiting the young girls, right? And bothering the children, right? And so from an early age, the goal was always protecting the culture, right? Even in the physical sense. And I couldn't fathom how a grown man or somebody would literally want to take the innocence and the purity of a young girl and put her on a track and destroy her. But they will really prey upon children, right? And so we were always tasked with things that had nothing to do with our age, right? It had something to do with our spirit and our readiness and our willingness and being soldiers. So we're giving orders. I don't have to like the orders, but we got to complete them. And that's where the discipline comes in. So I don't have that ability of, oh, I don't feel like doing it. No, do it. Do what you don't feel like, like you want to, right? That's where that greatness comes from. Being able to steer your will regardless of, you know, you're tired or whatever position of life you may be in. I had many jobs growing up, right? Uh, I was a hustler. I remember selling toys as a little kid. You know, I remember selling drugs, right? We sold, we sold drugs on a block in St. Louis. You know, by the time I got back to St. Louis, um, because I left St. Louis, probably, I mean, Oakland around the fifth, sixth grade. It was still a black Muslim school I went to in St. Louis, at least for the first year. And then after that, I started going to public school. Public school was different. That's where Savage Kings come from. You know what I'm saying? That's, that wasn't the same level of discipline, right? The, what I thought was bad at the private school and public school, it was just completely wild, right? That's where everything was sexualized. Everything was crazy and it was just different. But that's when, you know, my mother and father were together at that time. And, you know, my mother, she did the greatest that she could possibly do, right? As a single woman raising all these boys, right? Because my father wasn't always there. He'd be in and out of the household. And this is a lot, a lot of people don't know this. They think that my family just always together. There were times where brief moments in history, not the longest, where we had to sleep in the van. There was time where we had to sleep at you know, uh, friends' houses, right? Times when my family didn't have houses, we had to sleep over relatives and times where, shoot, we had to sleep in a shelter before, right? And so and just that, growing up with nothing sometimes, you know, not even feeling like you have a place to belong, man, it, 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 it makes you feel like anything you do to survive is justified, you know what I'm saying? Like if, if you want something and it can't be given to you by someone else, you got to go get it yourself. So that's where the selling drugs come in, because in my environment, the people who had money when I was in St. Louis were the drug dealers. They pull up in a nice car. Right. They look right. Look what I got. You know what I'm saying? They show off on purpose. They couldn't wait to give you a pack so that you can go out there and sell it. But I always had an independent mind, so I never wanted to work for nobody. You know, talking about, so I will always find routes and ways to still be independent, even in that. And I had an older brother who was in the streets, right? And so my older brother would do his thing. He was the one that had showed me the ropes of the streets, but then he would leave to go to college and different places. So, you know, that experience that I got from him, I'll still be on my own independent. So my father not there, my older brother not there. So I become the older brother, right? I got all together of us as nine brothers and sisters. Right, two older sisters, one older brother, and the rest are all younger brothers. And so, you know, it was a lot of times where I felt alone in the sense that I'm the one that has my back, but I always felt that my older brothers and my older, uh, my, my pops would avenge me if anything happened. So they gave me a sense of comfort, knowing like, y'all don't even know, like my pops and them is killers, so I right, do what you want. I'm like, I'm gonna protect myself, but if something, goes wrong I already know it's get back and that was necessary because my my respect for my father was different because he wasn't always there to like play catch with me and teach me about women and teach me the life and the ropes but other men respected him he had a reputation 
And I always remembered that is what I want. You know what I'm saying? The way other men spoke about my father, I want them to have that same level of respect. Some men feared him because he would be willing to go the furthest distance for his respect and his honor, right? And my mother, she just always told us the right things to do, whether we listened to it or not. And she was just always ready and willing to make the sacrifice for us at all times. But I never grew up wanting to be like my mother. I grew up wanting to be like my father, right? And so that makes a child rebel against what their mother has to say, because I used to figure if I do what my mother says, then I'm like my mother, right? But if I do what my father does, then I'm like my father, right? And so that is something I became self-aware of as an adult. Like, I know I love my mother, but I don't want to listen, but I used to make sure that I didn't bring heartbreak to her. So when I was out in the street, she didn't know everything that I was doing. I'll come home and I'd be chill. My, my siblings didn't know everything that I was doing. Right, because I never wanted to bring the streets to the house, right? But when we sell the weed, and sometimes the cops will show up looking for me, and we get arrested and interrogated, and you know, we we got caught into a, a few different cases when I was younger, and you know, probably had maybe like four, five little petty cases growing up, um, up until you know the age of nineteen. That's when I caught a big case. Father and my co defendant was my brother and some other brothers. And they said that I was involved in an assault. Um, long story short, you know, we took that to trial. Uh, and that was a pivotal lesson in life because that's where I learned the power of knowledge, right? Because it was a time where I was able to use knowledge in a way to where it gave me my freedom. You know, I remember being locked up for maybe about a month. And the book that I was reading it was a storybook, and this book was entertaining, but it had nothing to do with my freedom, right? So as I was done, I read it from cover to end, and I think it was the first book I ever read from cover to end, because I usually get the concept of a book and I'm done, but it was a story, so you gotta read the whole thing. I had characters that I made up in my mind, who was each person, and it was very vivid. And I can understand why people read so many books when they locked up. But I remember when I finished it, it was just this feeling of, him. All you did was distract yourself from reality, you know? And, and you just read and spent all this time, yet you're no more empowered as you were when you first picked up that book, right? And my older brother, he was the one, I got extradited from like, I think it was Iowa to Oakland. He was the one after I got extradited and bailed out and gave me a list of books to read. And these books started to empower my mind more right tactical and practical things that i could do ways to observe and look at the system right understanding the deception of the system understanding the art of war learning how to communicate there was a lot of things like it just i just felt the neurons in my brain firing and i remember telling my lawyer things to do right for the case and i remember you know even when we beat our case he was like this is the first case i won to this day i don't know if he's joking you know what i'm saying but i can believe it and if I didn't do that studying and I didn't have the certain amount of discipline that I had at the time and the training that I got from FOY, I don't think I would have beat my case because I was the only one in that case that got a complete not guilty. Everybody else got a mistrial. So that means that the jurors completely decided that I wasn't guilty and the rest of them, they couldn't decide whether they were guilty. It still allowed them to beat their case, but it could have been retried, right? So I got a completely not guilty and I just remember thinking like, I'm never going back to information and knowledge unless it's useful to my freedom in some practical way. And I've always been that child that believed that I was destined for something. Always believed in my ability and my power. And I've tried to hold on to this feeling of destiny my whole life until I changed the world, right? And, you know, I allow myself to be guided by God. He just gives me the vision. He gives me what's next. And I can feel it being swelled up when it's time. And I know when I complete a certain phase of the mission and he say, just wait, I got more instructions for you. So I try to be a patient soldier in that sense, right? And everything that we do is imperfect. I've started organizations, you know, and it could be a time where I wasn't ready. It could be a time where the naivety of thinking that, you know, these amount of individuals coming together is going to work when nobody else has made it work, right? 
It's just my ability to not believe in those limits, but it's also the failing forward that's necessary to be great in life. So I've had organizations that were multi-million dollar organizations and there were greedy individuals that messed it up, right? And then I had to learn how to rebuild from there, right? And now we're at a place where I take all of those lessons and I embed it into everything that I do. So, you know, I have to be proud of those mistakes because without them, then I couldn't know how to be successful, right? So, you know, the teaching and the educating, the financial literacy and spirituality and all of these different things, you know, I'm just working to put out in the world what I don't see enough of, right? And my mother told me, stop complaining and go do. If you see a problem, solve it. What you complain? Why are you waiting on somebody else to do it? Right. When I hear people complaining about different leaders, well, maybe if it was more, it would be easier. Maybe if they had an army behind them, maybe if they could call upon you when they needed to. Right. They would move completely different. Maybe instead of complaining about them, you could send them a blueprint. You understand me? It's like if anybody's willing to step up, help that person. Make sure that they're guided and they don't go in the wrong direction. Because sometimes I see people that have the ability to be great. But the world, the world grabs them, right? And the world start impressing them. And then the people, you know, uh, uh, of outside the culture, those are the ones giving them opportunity and money and telling them, oh, we like what you're doing. And so they pull them away. But when the culture don't do that. The culture don't have the resources to do it, right? So we don't even have that loyalty to those who step up and go out there and trailblaze and kick down the door and be revolutionaries, be radical, be truth tellers. When they do that, what is the responsibility of the people to have loyalty to those people? The same way people have loyalty to their people, right? And so I think that we have a very flawed way of thinking when it comes to those who step up. When you step up, somebody else is supposed to step towards you. You're not supposed to chase your people. It's supposed to be a collaboration. So anybody that does any amount of this work, it becomes hard because the very people that you are trying to serve, it is very people who try to hurt you. Right. And so it becomes hard for you to disassociate the enemy from the friend. And so I see people lose their will and their passion for it. And they say, you know what? I've done enough. I'm going to just do me. Right. So there's a lot of retired revolutionaries in that sense. Right. And the ones that lived it were killed and were died. People say they love them. But how do they honor them? I think I was one of those children that always wanted to know the answer. I was always like challenging myself to see how smart I was. Right. If I seen somebody else that was smarter than me, then it let me know that, oh, well, I can do that, too. And I refused to ever think that I was dumb. I just I remember an instance where. An adult definitely said something and then changed their word later on. And I remember one of the disciplinarians at the school uh, or the teachers, they asked me a question and I'm like, you know, this is what so and so said. Then the teacher was like, but I didn't say that. And I'm like, yes, you did. And then it was like, okay, we're well, calling me a liar. And I'm like, well, I'm not calling me a liar, you know? And, and, and it made me realize like adults, not real. You know what I'm saying? They are liars. And you're just supposed to go along with authority because they have it, not because they right. And that let me know that this is a gang. That let me know that this is a system. It has nothing to do with what is actually truthful and what is false, right? It has to do with authority and power. And I'm supposed to be a slave to you because you're in a position. So I stopped respecting those positions instantly after that. If your job is not to tell me the truth, my job is not to tell you the truth. If you don't have to do right by me, I don't have to do right by you. I have to learn how to move in this world full of snakes. So as they taught me about the nature of the devil, right, that runs this world, I started to see that devil in men and women. And they didn't know I seen that in them, right? They didn't know I knew that they were lying. They didn't know I didn't have respect for them but I will play the game. So I learned at an early age, you know, I was one of them children that played the game in the sense that I have to be cool with the teacher. Or I have to do this just to get through this. Not that this actually has real meaning because I learned that adults can tell you anything and it's not true. I've seen the highest level of, of hypocrites from the very people who taught me truth, right? But they live false. So I learned to disassociate the person from the message. Right. So that means that I learned to take the good from the bad. We call it a nation settling on the good part. I was a child that, you know, I would go speak on the stage. We had what they call a uh, soul beat, which is a channel in Oakland. 
and we had Savior's Day, and every Savior's Day I had to give a speech. Sometimes about social justice, sometimes it was about the planets, right, and Jupiter, or it could have been about multiple things. And every year I was one of the best, most outspoken people. But I, and I never really thought like that was a badge of honor or anything. That's just what came natural to me. Right. I never even really related that as like a gift or skill, like communication. I always thought that was my older brother in the family. Right. So I didn't grade myself by that, but that was a skill that I always had. And I know ever since I was a child, I've always been a thinker. Right. I used to win spelling beans and I used to just take this pride and winning and being smart. We used to have drill competitions. I win those. Right. So for me, I was always a resourceful, willful, creative, hustling young child. Right. But also I was never just constantly told I was special. Right. I was never given like, yo, you gonna be the greatest this, that and the third in the world. No, nah, I feel like that's what I thought for my older brother. Right. But I was never spoiled and showered with, you know, compliments. So I think that that kind of gave me a sense of overachievement that in order for me to be seen, I have to achieve way more. Right. And so I believe that's kind of how I operate to this day is I operate with a sense of overachievement and I operate with a sense of, you know, my love language is helping others because that's the way I used to feel that other people would see my value as if I was helping in some way. Right. And then I learned that that could be a crutch. So now I teach people how to help themselves. The typical day in life is waking up and thinking about what needs to be done, right? Um, and it changes, right, throughout time. Before I had a team, everything was relying on me and I would have to think about what is my thing for the day, right? So it can be, I'm focusing on writing a book. So guess what? Nothing else matters besides this book, right? But then I will always make sure that it's not just the book, it's, the machine and everything that's going to be necessary for when the book is ready, right? So it's the marketing in the meantime. So it's the 80% work and the 20% preparing for when the work is done, right? So, you know, I also knew that I got to wake up and I got to calibrate my mind, right? So like right now, I wake up every single day and I think about what I'm grateful for, right? So that I can increase the amount of things to be grateful for. Right now, I wake up and I think about working out so I can have more energy. I can feel good. And when you feel good, you do good. That's when you start to be in flow. Right. I wake up and, you know, I want to put some information in my head so it gets my brain going and thinking. Right. And I wouldn't say that my schedule is like some consistent, very annual thing. It's just about what I believe is necessary to be physically and mentally ready for the day. And then what vision that I'm going for and which vision is more prevalent for that to focus on. So when we building out high level conversations, if I put all my energy on that, that means I'm looking for guests. That means I'm looking for topics and every single thing that I do, right? I'm always looking for creative energy design applications, everything. If I'm watching a movie, I'm studying the way that this movie is shot so that I can apply it some way to the way we shoot things, right? So all of that is more so about me taking the theme of my day and pointing it towards whatever the vision is and then counting how many things that I've done in that day that gets me closer to that vision, right? So now we have multiple things. So, you know, I try to focus on the most prevalent and the biggest thing in that day. So working out is an everyday thing. Meditating is an everyday thing. I got my prayer rug right here. That's an everyday thing. I gotta bow down to God every single day, right? I don't, man can't tell me to be humble. Only God can. And prayer is humility, right? So that prayer is an everyday task. That's more important than eating, right? So again, that's another thing. Like I, you normally eat one meal a day unless I'm working out and I'm trying to get them gains. So therefore I'm eating more. So working out is a daily activity, right? I'm learning something, whether it's reading or whether I'm listening to a book or whether I'm watching a YouTube channel, right? Or whether I'm having a conversation with somebody or whether I'm going through an experience and I reflect on the experience. Learning is an everyday thing. Some days I will spend time writing out what needs to be done for the rest of the days. And then when I complete that list, I go back to writing again. 
right? But I have notes that I take all throughout the day just to make sure that, like my brother Mechie told me, create a second brain system, right? So, you know, it, there's there's not a, a, a 100% set system, but there is every day waking up thinking about the vision and being impregnated with that vision so that everything you do is in alignment with that vision. Getting a team is important, but it's not necessary to get started. You need no one to get started, right? Um, and relying on others can be a strength or it can be a weakness, right? Depending on where you at in life. Getting started just requires you to start. There's, there's not a... Heh, life execution is steps. If the only thing that stops a person from starting now is thinking how hard step 10 is before they do step one, right? So if you walk into a room and it's dirty, you're like, oh, I don't feel like doing it. You may be thinking about the last thing you got to pick up instead of the first thing because cleaning up is a step-by-step -step process, right? Thinking about where everything needs to go, right? First, that's the first step. All right, where will I put the shoes? Where will I put the shirts? Where is the place for everything? Once I have a place for everything, what do I need to do next? Decide where I want to start. Well, I want to start with the shoes, all right? Now I'm in the rhythm with the shoes. Okay, what's next? Let me start with the whites and the blacks. Right. Let me start with, you know, um, sweeping the floor. Right. All you're doing is going step by step. And then eventually you've completed all the steps and you're done. But it's being present. But the moment you start thinking about doing everything at once, you become overwhelmed. And then you want to escape instead of getting it done. Right. And so, you know, when you have that sort of willfulness to be step by step, you always ready. And so for me, my formula is first identify what you want to do. Uh, second, identify the knowledge necessary in order to get it done, right? And then three, execute. And then repeat, rinse, that's the cycle. So there should never be a point in time where I don't know what to do next, right? That's my process. I find myself right now in the spirit of growing a bigger vision, but I know the process is observation, right? So if I'm in that process of observation, I'm not going to become impatient thinking I want to be executing right now. Right. No, I'm supposed to be observing. That's the work. Right. And sometimes people think like being busy is work and it's not always because being busy is not always productive. Right. There's people that's in the gym every day and they lose no weight. Right. They busy in the gym, but they ain't really putting in that work, that productive work. because They're not eating right outside the gym. Right. They didn't. They're not learning about the body. They're not training in the type of rhythm. They're not consistent in the right way to where they're actually going to be productive. I can see two people going into jail. One is completely ignorant of the science of the body and the mind, right? And another person is completely educated on it. Who do you think will get results first, right? The person that is educated because it's also the work you do before you get started, right? Before I had a show, we study in marketing, we study in branding, we study in production, study in development, I'm studying what I want to get done. That's all written down, right? So it's like, there's there's levels to where you are in the process, but all of it is success. And when it comes to a team, the team is necessary. First, after you get started with the vision and you've exhausted what you can do by yourself, especially if you don't have resources or leverage or equity to give to that team. Right. So keep building it till it gets to the inexhaustible point where you absolutely need somebody else. Then you have something to leverage to say, yo, come over here. I can pay you. Well, I'll give you equity in this. Look what I built. You want a partner? Right? Now that's different. But if you get you the right team, you can build the right dream. I always say, you know, if I want to get something done, do it myself. If I want to do more, I get you a team. So I always want to do more. So I need a big team. Right? But it's the core team. Right? It's the, the, the visionary, the idea generator. It's the executor, the relationship builder. Right. It's the executor, the person that just going and get things done. Right. The, the, the organizer, all of these things come into, you know, um, one symbiotic, you know, synergistic, just championship team where y'all can do anything in the world and nothing can stop you because you got all bases covered. Right. So, yes, a team is 100 percent necessary if you want to do something great. If you want to do something regular, do it by yourself. Don't waste nobody else's time. That I'm crazy, <laughs> that I'm not normal, that my spirit is rare, 
because I picked the hardest things in the world to do. I could be like the person that just want to work for the next man, right? Because that man has built something and he could just tell me what to do and I don't have to think for myself and it's less energy. But it tells me that I was born with a spirit to lead. It tells me that I was raised with that spirit, that that's what I've cultivated and that that's the only thing that will make me satisfied in this life is producing value, right? And being an entrepreneur is producing value and is managing the value that you produce to maximize it in this world. It's being of service, right? It taught me that I'm a strategist because anytime there's a problem, I just need the information and then I know how to move, right? Ignorance does not allow me to know what to do next. But once the information is there, oh, I'm fine. It told me that I'm stoic. In times of chaos, I can be calm, right? So, you know, there's been a lot of different things and then it also taught me how to deal with people. And that's probably been the hardest thing because I'm very tough love and I have to learn how to, you know, give people the love necessary to cultivate them, right? Because sometimes I push people, but I'm not cultivating them, right? It's a, it's a, if, if, you know, pushing a person is the equivalent of the sun always shining down on a plant, right? But that could kill a plant, right? It can burn it out, right? That plant needs to sleep as well. It needs rest. So you have to know the cycles of shedding light on a person to help them grow and foster their potential versus just challenging and pushing and pushing and pushing to that point where instead of pushing somebody to their edge where they can be in their greatness, you can push them off the ledge, right? So finding that fine tune, but that all comes with self-awareness, right? And understanding why am I like that? Oh, because I got that. But that may not be what they need. That was what was needed to make me who I am. My moment of wonder was when I did my first speech. I was hired to come speak at this young black brotherhood at Chabot. And they asked me to come speak because they used to see me speak on Instagram just about my journey because I had a shop in Oakland, California where I sold my old clothes that I designed, right? So the crowns that you see, glasses, I sold my old art, right? I'm an artist. And when they asked me to come speak, they wanted to pay me they're like $500. But I always said that if you have a gift, especially one that people are willing to pay for, you have to use that in some capacity to change the world if that's something you're good at, right? So it automatically opened my mind to a whole new reality. First time I'm getting paid to speak. Like this was like, y'all about to pay me to speak? Okay. So I remember going into it with this grand scale vision of what I believe was going to play out. I've always been super imaginative and I always, <laughs> I think about the greatest outcome all the time. But I'm talking about an outcome that's magnificent. Like, you know, I'm gonna put this video out, Denzel go see it, he gonna ask me to be in a new movie, it's gonna be amazing. So I remember thinking like, yo, I'm gonna go speak at this school. And when I speak at this school, everything that I say is gonna go viral and it's gonna change the world. It doesn't my mind. Like I'm going in there with this imagination. Yeah, like, you know, a person would say, be humble, right? Cause like, bro, you getting paid $500 for your first speaking gig and you do it too much. But I had a plan. So I took half of the money and I paid my bro Jay Short at the time. And I told him, I need you to come film me for a couple of hours, right? Um, I need high level quality. So he set up two cameras. And when I got there, I had on my crown. I had on this jacket that I made. It was a velvet biker jacket with a panther on the back. And uh, I stood in front of there and I remember thinking, I'm not just speaking to these students, I'm speaking to the world. And I said that I wanna give them all of the keys that I've learned thus far that I think are necessary, right? To go on this journey in life and be successful. And I stood in that square for about an hour and a half and I delivered this message. And when I got the footage back, Jay Short had sent me over some edits and I thought that they were too polished. It wasn't what I was going for. It wasn't what was in the vision that I saw. So I said, just send me the raw. And then I edited them myself. I put on my own sound effects, right? But I also understood the power of the caption. I knew that I could be misunderstood if I don't put context to this because of the way that I grew up it means something different when I say things versus the connotation that's attached to what somebody else listened 
because we don't always have operational definitions that we have the same understanding and meaning to things. So I always put the caption like, okay, for further understanding of what I'm talking about, right? And I remember dropping the first clip and it went viral. And I dropped the second clip, it went viral. And I just was dropping these clips and clips and clips. And the wonder of it was that it did exactly what I thought it was going to do. And it was an extreme level of validation about my imagination that I'm not tripping, that this is not an illusion, that the thoughts that I have are real, that what I think about myself, other people can see it as well. You got celebrities posting it all over. It's going viral all over the world. People are tapping into me. And that was my moment of wonder that let me know that everything that I know about myself is 100% true. And it also let me know that if those thoughts are real, then the rest of my imagination is real as well. So I used to sell, the, the, the name 19 Keys came in box, I used to sell a lot of cocaine. <laughs> the name 19 Keys came about from Maswa Adam Muhammad. Maswa Adam Muhammad was the teacher of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Elijah Muhammad taught, was taught under him, was a student under him for three and a half years. And after that education that he got, um, he was able to go change the world, right? He created the nation of, or produced the nation of Islam, right? In the 30s. Maswar Muhammad has a famous quote. He said that at the time there were 17 million original people and there was 2 million natives. And that represents the 19 million rusty locks. And he said there's 19 million well oil keys to unlock in these rusty lock mines. Those keys were interchangeable for knowledge itself, for enlightenment, right? So that a people could never be oppressed again and put in darkness. And that number 19 is a deep number. It's an esoteric number. It's a number of completion. That's a representation of the smallest digit and the largest digit, the one and the nine, right? It's a representation of balance. It's a representation of masculine and feminine. It's a representation of conscious and subconscious, right? It's a, it's a representation of sperm and egg. So when those two are together, it's a representation of something to be observed, a full truth to be understood. So I've always used that number 19 as, you know, my symbol of all truth. When I see that 19 attached to something, it lets me know that there's something to be discovered. There's something more going on here, right? And I've used that throughout my journey very synchronistically. And I always tell people, really, I'm not 19 keys. I represent 19 keys, right? Like my, that 19 for me, right, is my deeper observation beyond the numbers is where I see beyond the veil, beyond the symbols, and I see the truth. I go beyond the fruit and I understand the root. Right, and so that's the way I go about looking at things from the smallest to the highest, smallest level to the highest level, right? And that's the way I go about teaching, speaking, and explaining, conceptualizing information in ways that I believe can help unlock the mind with these keys. So sometimes my demonstration is a key. I can do push-ups on a jet ski, that's a key, because it's just letting us know we can do whatever we want, we're free. You know what I'm saying? It's reminding people to work out. I ain't gotta tell you, go work out, go do this. No, I'm demonstrating, it's gonna make you wanna do that at the same time, I can show you how I speak. I can go build things. I can go travel around the world. I can, you know, um, create number one shows that are long form, that are about consciousness, that are counter narrative to everything that they said will work and we make it happen. I can be on all of the most popular shows in the world. Why? Because I'm 19 Kings. So that means that you ain't got to be a rapper, an entertainer, a sucker, or none of those things. You can actually be yourself. You can develop an idea in the world and play with reality because you are God, right? And that's what it's about. The 19 Keys is truly about developing the mind of God, right? Taking thoughts outside your head and bringing them into reality, seeing beyond the symbols and seeing reality, right? And those 19 Keys, you know, it's those same keys that will bring together you know, the diaspora and the peoples all around the world to jump you out the matrix and get those keys to sell. The crown has multiple dimensions of importance to me. There's the connection between when I was younger, I used to wear bandanas. I used to wear red bandanas, right, in the streets. Uh, I remember Joel Santana used to always wear his bandanas so crispy. He used to iron it out, that thing's sharp. 
But I used to think about the movie Colors, so then people seeing Colors, people learn how to game bang. I would think about the Paisley print, and I'm like, who created that Paisley print? And I just think about the world and all the things that we do that's traditional, but we didn't design them. But we represent them with pride and heritage, right? These are not, we have true symbols that are our symbols. And then we have ones that we take from like Europeans and things of that nature, and we just wear them. And under that same symbol and insignia, we kill and murder each other. Right, I, I just felt like that was a representation of um, a nigga culture when that self is an arrogant. And me growing up as a Muslim, as a young guy, I said, damn, what do we have that can be in connection to the streets and urban, but it's like, we can say these are the rituals and rites and things you put on when you represent some opposite of the culture, a higher level culture, right? Higher level consciousness. There's no symbolism like that a lot, right? And as I studied, the history of different movements as they were founded, you see uniform, right? You see rituals attached to it, right? So I said, okay, number one, I wanted to be a movement of my own, right? So I went and I designed a crown that was inspired by Elijah Muhammad's crown because he wore that starry crown. And he said in theology of time, we wear that crown on our lapel and on our head to represent we're rulers in the universe, right? And then as I started studying more, you see the sun, moon, and stars has always been utilized throughout antiquity by people in the representation of the cosmos. The Akan people, specifically where in Ghana, they utilize the sun, moon, and stars as well. It's a representation of man and woman. It's a representation of family. It's a representation of chiefdom and position and wisdom, right? And, you know, it's like, it's one of those rituals where it's like, what represents our royalty? right what represents who we are so i put that crown on my head and i remember i used to always just make sure i wore it a certain way like my hair is a little high now but i wanted you to see it like a crown with a top stuck up and i could all get them made today without the tie in the back but that bandana tie is a representation of being inspired by the urban culture and bringing that high level energy down to earth right so that we have a connection to it and so people love it because they put it on right and they feel empowered. I call it crown for this. You put that crown on, you get that crown for this. You know what I'm saying? All of a sudden you feel more empowered and more confident as you move throughout the world. But people don't even know why the symbol is so empowered, but it's in your DNA, right? So you can't tell a symbol, no. We live in a world of symbols, right? A man who has true enlightenment, they see beyond symbols, right? But symbols are communication. They are autonomous. They have information built into it that is directly connected to our DNA because our ancestral line has seen, you know, these symbols throughout eternity. And so when we see certain symbols, it automatically has a connection to us. So that sun, moon, and stars is the same one. So when you wear it on your head, what's that saying? Right? It's, it's universal, it's powerful, it's invoking, it's royal. Everywhere I go, it's respected. So you know, studying the yogis, they represented through the crown chakra, right? They even said Prophet Muhammad would get visions at night, peace be upon him, right? That represent that crown chakra of intellectualism and wisdom, right? So it's like we wear hats that represent teams we don't own, right? But we love it. We wear hats that represent brands that we don't own but they supposed to connect us to our social wealth status. What about our spiritual wealth status? So we were status symbols all day long. So people think that we have something, but what do we wear so people know who we are? And that's where that crown come in. Doing push-ups at the slave castle, which was a very emotional thing. I'm still emotional about it today. And time I think about it, I don't know, it's, it's you know, uh, it made me tear up a bit being there. And I feel like when I went there, it's an overwhelming feeling. And that overwhelming feeling of just knowing the evil atrocities that occurred there in that place. And those people that had to endure that. And the representation of that atrocity is what we endured and endured in America. Right? So I felt the direct connection because it didn't feel like something in the past. It felt like something in the now. And so when I was there, I didn't want to leave with a feeling of just being down. I didn't want to just leave like I'm defeated because that's how those people that went through the point of return felt. 
So how can me as a free man walk away with that same feeling? How can they, how come, if, if I believe the spirit of my ancestor is there, how can I make them proud by feeling the same way that they did when they were in chains? So I, in the moment it came natural to me, like turn that pain into power like you do everything else. That's your gift, it's transmutation. We are an alchemical people. Our melanin literally turns harsh radiation into energy and it becomes useful and abundant energy, right? As an American that we went through, you know, a multitude of atrocities, but it never broken us, right? So our spirit is not a broken spirit, right? It's a spirit of repairment. It's a spirit of re-energizing, right? It's a spirit of, you know, um, the phoenix that rises from the ashes, right and transmute that power so i started doing the push-ups to give myself that energy and also let my that the, the the spirit that was there be lifted and changed a little bit like you know they said that was the point of no retiring where i'm like i'm gonna take y'all with me now you know what i'm saying y'all get to retiring with me you know what i'm saying like you know you you ain't gotta feel down no more this 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 has to be a place like in new orleans they celebrate death some people only cry when there's death right so it's like Am I going there with the spirit? If I'm going there with this spirit of a free man, but I leave with the spirit of a slave, right? What has changed if those evil devils that did that still make our people feel bad when they walk in there? Nah, I want to go in there and be like, nah, we in power now. We free now. Y'all free. Lift up, stand up. And we ain't got to be in pain no more. We ain't got to constantly be triggered no more in order for us to be enlightened. I'm tired of that. And nobody in the diaspora, nobody in the world can tell me how to feel. Nobody in the world can tell me what I can and can't do, especially in my demonstration of gaining my power and showing my people what it's like to turn pain into power because they don't know what we go through on a daily basis. You talking about a symbol that's supposed to be a representation of why we in America and why we lost and don't know and have knowledge of self and you're gonna tell me how to respond? You are trying to be an oppressor. You trying to be a colonizer, right? You telling me what to do is, is you telling me I'm your slave. And to me, that energy don't exist in my reality. That exists in your reality, because I'm a God. So as a God, maybe nobody else on the planet Earth was supposed to go there and perform that ritual but me, right? And so for me, that's what it's about because I really don't need symbolisms of slavery. We need more symbolisms of royalty, right? I want to go where the kings sit. I want to see the king's chamber. I want to go where they architect the plans of Timbuktu. Right. I want to go and learn the lessons of how the kings of Mali built wealth. Right. I want to go sit at the study where Hannibal Barker was developing plans and strategies to go to war with Rome. Right. Don't tell me that I need to go to the slave castle as a journey. Right. For empowerment, because I think that it was very powerful and it was it was uh, it's just hard to explain. But if we don't do the other ones as well and we just connect a history because everybody wasn't slaves to a dungeon? What are we saying about ourselves? Because my history didn't start nowhere near that. So for me, I just can't demonstrate like everybody else. I believe it's important to travel this whole planet Earth. Everybody comes from us. Oh. Buster Rhyme said it best. He said, there were no black cavemen. It's no such thing as a black caveman. That where we started. <laughs> Why are there no black cave? You don't see no depictions of it. Not where we started. This whole planet Earth, when you go deep in history, they started from dark, melanated, original people. So all of them is ours. I can find a connection to all of the original people and the native indigenous people all throughout the planet Earth. Whether I'm going to Brazil, you go to Asia, and you go see those same people from uh, Asia over there. They came from here and that's their origins. So for me, I'm going around and I'm visiting a representation of my lineage everywhere I go. But I will say what about Ghana is, it's something, there's, there's something about the spirit of the people here that I resonate with, right? And there's lessons that I'm learning just to observing the collectiveness and the spirit and the, the cultures because you have to respect the place in order to truly honor it, right? So I respect the different ethnicities that exist out here, right? You don't come out here and just say everybody's the same because they are all Africans. You know, they, they have different ways of going about doing things the same way we have the east, south, north, west, 
We have different dialects. You can tell where people are from, the way they speak, the way they move. We have different hospitalities in different regions. So first is recognizing the nuances of the culture. But there's something about a level of safety that I feel here, a level of peace, a level of joy, a level of connection, uh, opportunity, right? And then, you know, I've been riding with, you know, Good Brother Freedom in Memphis and it's showing me around different real estate developments. And to be honest, I've been extremely inspired in a way that I've never been inspired in the U.S. before. It just feels like I've been in this fake world this whole entire time, and I've been told to play a game that was rigged. And I was never told about the other sports that I'm probably better at. And when you travel, you realize there are other leagues that you can play in, that your skills can go further in that you actually can be more peaceful in, that's better for you, right? To have rules that fit you and who you are. And uh, you have to ask yourself, the only reason you're still playing that is because that's what you know. That's what you've been indoctrinated in, right? But when you get exposed to certain things, your mind can't contract. Now it's larger, the vision is larger, the global effect steps in. I see no reason why I couldn't enjoy living in Africa for the rest of my life. Right, I don't see, like the, the idea that America is just this great place is the biggest deception on the planet Earth. The reason is because everybody's living or everybody's working, but nobody's living. There are people with way less, but less in material, but they have way more wealth and spirit. They have way more wealth and joy, right? I'm talking about considerably more. And everybody wants to make it in America so that they can go work, but they leave in the place where they already live. So for me, being out here is a perspective that I needed, right? So now my work changes, but it also makes me see things in a light where it's like, you can see the most disgusting parts of your culture, right? And it's like, man, we be wasting time when we could just be building, right? Like my mommy said, separation is the only solution. We try so hard to play a rigged game and win. When we, we, we 100% know it's rigged, we tell everybody else it's rigged, and then we tell you to play the guy. How about you play a game that's not rigged where you can actually win? How about you go buy some land you can actually own? Right? Not being borrowed land that you pay on for the rest of your life. Right? How about you go to a place where the food isn't poison? That sounds like a good idea to me. Right, so being out here, man, and I've only been out here a few short days, so I'm not going to speak as I'm like, you know, fully immersed in the experience yet, but, you know, I've been to South Africa, I've been to North Africa, and so coming out here, it, it feels like a piece of God's plan for me that I needed. And it's, it's impregnating my mind with my next vision, and it's really telling me, like, I have to build. Like, I have to build. Like everything else that you've done that is great, but black people have to build something and we have to stop making excuses, right? And we have to stop buying into the destructive culture that we have because those are enemies of progress. Anytime we see something that is successful, that is counter culture, is an enemy of progress. And we have to stop celebrating our enemies because sometimes our enemies look like us because they will build their success at the detriment of our progress. And I'm just open to learn and observe and build and, you know, study and, you know, um, be mentored by the atmosphere and everything that's out here. And there are some things that, you know, can be changed everywhere on the planet Earth. We live in some of the worst conditions because we, and I'm not talking about levels of standard of living. It's in the sense that um, in America, there's always a war. And without peace, there can be no freedom. Um, they got pink nails. If they wear a purse or a dress and it's a man. If they got like devil worship tattoos and 666. <laughs> Uh, I'm not joking. Um, no, but character, uh, ethnicity, right? 
in Africa, everybody here is melanated, dark skinned, what we call black. So I can't use that to know whether you're a brother or not. I have to see your spirit, whether you got the same mission, vision, values, right? If you're connecting to the same agendas and ideas that I have for the world, what is your inner consciousness, right? What is the, the amount of self-knowledge that you have in your spirit of who you are? It has nothing to do with what you look like on the outside, but what you look like on the inside. So, you know, a man that knows how to move about this world, that has a masculine energy, that has a willfulness, that has determination, presence, grit, stoicism, intellect, knowledge of self, right? Those are things I look for, integrity, right? That's what I'm looking for when I want to build with somebody. And in America, because of the diversity, we fooled all the time to believe in that we're supposed to unify with somebody because of their race. No, you unify with people of the same ethnic background. Any uh, ears that's willing to listen to truth, you can't waste it, even if they're not ready to receive it now. It's a seed being planted, so you're still doing your job as a farmer, right? Because that's who we are. We plant seeds sometimes. And so for me, if you're interested and you're willing to listen, then I'm willing to tell you. Hey, I don't try to force myself for nothing. It's like, if, if you come to me, then obviously I must have a value, right? If you tell me about a problem, you better be ready to listen to a solution, all right? That's how I am. But I'm not trying to force nobody because I'm not trying to save everybody. Only those who are willing to save themselves. And so you interested in hearing about the mission? Listen and pay attention, right? And then why that? Everything is flow. I'm not walking around and say, hey, hey, listen to me. I got all the answers. Hey, listen to me. I'm the new prophet. I am doing all of that. If a person finds me, because a lot of times I meet people at different points in time. I used to tell people I am them 19 keys and sometimes people, whatever. Those same people, maybe a year later, bro, I didn't know who he was at first, but I've been following you ever since you told me who he was. And I'm learning so much. I've changed this in my life. I'm changing my business. I'm changing my marriage. I'm changing everything, right? And so that lets me know that it works when it's supposed to, right? In Islam, we always say there is no um, there's no um, compulsion in Islam. Man, you don't force nobody to believe what you believe. If a person wants to learn a truth, then tell them a the truth. And then in everything else, you just demonstrate it until they ask. It's like if you eating good and you working out and you start getting big and fit and buff, a person go want to know how, right? But imagine day one, you telling people, yo, I'm about to do this, you should do this as well. Like, man, come on, man, get on my face, man, I'm doing this. But when you go demonstrate and you lead by example, they're going to start asking you questions because they're going to be inspired and want to do the same thing. I just want to be remembered as somebody who cared and who cared enough to make the sacrifice to do something. I want to build a legacy that is impactful to the point where it ripples for the next 1,000 years. The demonstration the information, the way I walk, the way I dress, the way I carry myself, my mistakes, my successes. I want it all to be a great lesson in the history of human beings on this planet Earth. So when they speak about the greatest names on this planet, they want to speak about mine. And not because I want them to, it's because I've done something of a value, right? That is a necessary lesson that has to continue to be passed on that represents building out a new world. They're going to say he's one of the architects of the new culture that we have. They're going to be like, man, if it wasn't for 19 Keys, music wouldn't be like this. This education space wouldn't be like this. Men and women wouldn't be walking around like this. We wouldn't be eating like this. And the beauty in that is I'm studying my ancestors, right? So anything that I do is a direct respect to them, right? It's like if I bring up information from Dr. Layla Ali or... Elijah Muhammad or Honorable Elijah Muhammad or Dr. Sebi, I don't have to come up with the information they already did. But they can be like, yo, he was one of the ones that made sure everybody knew about them, right? So, you know, that's my goal. And in order to do that, you have to care. You know what I'm saying? I want people to know that I care because when you got somebody on your side that you know that care, you can't give up. Peace, family. I got my 19 keys. And you just seen the wonders.